Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hey there. This week we chat with Trey Buck, who's the managing partner of Gravity Ventures. We go into Gravity's background in history, Trey's history, both as a professional and as a angel investor, uh, and his work in helping get Gravity stood back up and running. We talk a little bit about Fund 4, Fund 5, uh, tons of awesome talk here if you're considering raising funds from Gravity or another angel group, or if you're considering getting started in angel investing. I uh, hope you enjoy it like I did. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. For those of you, you know, looking to give your money away in a, a non-investment space, there's a really great company out there called the Ocean Cleanup. They are building technology to help clean our oceans. They are in a very early stage right now, but they've got prototype products out in the oceans right now, actively cleaning up the massive trash pile that is out there. You can donate to the company and get early access to some of the products that they're actually going to make out of the things that are taken out of the ocean. Um, I'm actually wearing their shirt right now. It's just theoceancleanup.com. Uh, really great cause and would love to see these guys succeed. So no, no tie. I don't have any financial or vested interests, but it's a really great, uh, really great idea. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we have Trey Buck, who's the managing partner of Gravity Ventures. Trey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate you having me on. Why don't we start with a brief history of Gravity Ventures as best you can tell it? I know that uh, you're kind of, you've only been involved from uh, Fund 4 onward, but would love to hear a little bit of the background about uh, with Gravity and kind of what the idea is and what you guys are trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. So... Gravity was started in 2008 by some pretty familiar faces, at least in the, the Midwest venture community, as a, a different type of model for investing in local tech companies. Uh, I know we'll talk a little bit about the you know the way that we invest here in a little bit, but the uniqueness of Gravity, I think, was very attractive uh, at the time, and is still something that that we certainly rely on today. There were three rounds of the fund in 2008, 2010, and 2012. Uh, you can actually go to the website and check out those funds and what they invested in today, www.gravityventures.com. And the, the fund itself was really oriented at providing an opportunity both for the local investing community and you know, angel investors that might otherwise have to do you know, their own deal sourcing, their own due diligence, and really kind of treat the investment process as a, as a solo endeavor. To be able to come together, you know, much like other angel networks out there, to be able to invest in in you know great companies, but offset also some of the risk of one doing it themselves, and then two, you know, typically the check sizes that angel investors like to write, you know, it, it can be difficult to deploy the the amount of capital that we that we ask of our uh, investing members in a sort of diverse portfolio set. So, you know, it's an opportunity to, to see a lot of deal flow, to see a lot of great companies, uh, entrepreneurs and, and ideas, but also to, you know, be a part of m probably more companies than you would be able to as an individual uh, if you were just kind of writing the checks that the size of checks that we that we focus on. So then how did you get involved in Fund 4 and maybe... By way of that question, maybe start with a little bit about your background and what brought you to Gravity? Yeah, absolutely. So myself and one of the other managing partners uh, about mid-year 2018 had found ourselves in uh, you know, jobs that had pulled us away from the entrepreneurial and startup community. Myself, I was a, an OR fellow in 2009. 
So, you know, I kind of came into the Indianapolis community, uh, hoping to be a part of small companies, you know, start a community writ large. And, you know, over the course of the years and, and time growing my professional career, I found myself you know, working for bigger companies, which is, is, is great, right? There's a lot of opportunity in big companies. There's a lot of stability. But at the same time, you know, you get a little bit disconnected from, you know, what, what's actually happening in the, in the local startup community in doing that. So, you know, I'd had kids and gotten a family and really wanted a way to start re-engaging with the startup community. So we started talking about what we could do, you know, the, the, could we start a company? Could we, you know, join some of the, the you know, sort of meetup groups that are around? And we started kind of brainstorming on starting a fund and, uh, several of the investors, including some of the managing partners of Gravity, had been investors in prior Gravity funds. And knowing that the the last round of Gravity, Gravity three, had been done in 2012, and then you know there has been a bit of hiatus, we thought, well, what well, what would it be like if we were to restart the fund? So with the blessing of the previous management team, and you know, thank you very much to to that team for for giving us the opportunity to pick this up and run with it. We started fundraising for a fourth fund in late 2018, and we actually closed in April of 2019 with the formal fund, Gravity Ventures Indiana Fund 4. Since then, we have made nine investments, and we can talk about the investment process here in a few minutes, all in Indiana-based companies, um, most of them from the Indianapolis area, uh, though we do have one from the Lafayette area as well. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you a ton of questions about Fund 4. And I know you're you're planning on Fund 5. I feel like it's probably worth a, a, just a really quick disclaimer. For anybody listening, this is not a solicitation for investment. Nobody's being asked to invest in Fund 5. Gravity is not asking to invest in your company. They're like This is just an informational back and forth between Trey and I. I'm super interested in how you view this process, both as a, a fund manager, as well as how you vet the startups that you work with. And hopefully, if, if you're listening to this, you'll get a lot out of this as well. So thanks. I just want to get that quick legal disclaimer in there. All right. So Trey, talk about the investment process you guys followed for Fund4. What, so what did it look like for a you know, sourcing deal flow, when a startup applies, what's the diligence process look like? How do you guys actually fund things? Uh, do you collect in, did you collect investor checks up front or did they invest in specific deals? Like break it all down for me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'll start by saying we were extremely formal when it comes to our, our deal flow process. And we've got, you know, every single box check that you would expect from every Silicon Valley based venture fund. Um, I, I, mean, I don't think that's on, true. I'm laying on the sarcasm just a little bit there. Yeah, no, we, we are... Uh, first, of all, I'll say that all of our both managers and investing members are working professionals. We have you know jobs and careers of our own. And Gravity is very much a labor of love, right? We, we understand that there's a lot of opportunity in this market and a lot of people building really great companies. And, you know, at the same time, we have uh, a slightly different mission than a typical VC fund in that we're, we really want to be part of building the community here. And yes, obviously, everybody who deploys capital and invests money in, in anything wants to see a return on that. Um, and that's certainly part of our goal. But we also have something a little bit more intrinsic as a part of our, our mission. And that, that, that is sort of borne out through the model that, that we use to invest with. So we are what we call a member managed fund, which means that ultimately our members and our investing members make the decisions on what we decide to invest in rather than a t traditional fund model, which would be you know, something more akin to sort of the GP general partner and LP limited partner um, with the GPs being basically the managers and the LPs being the investors and the GPs making all of the decisions and providing you know, visibility and transparency to their LPs, but not any real decision-making power uh, when it comes to the, the investments themselves. So Gravity, being me member-managed, uh, really puts that, that power in, of, of choice into the hands of our investing members. And that comes in the form of, of really two decisions. So a little bit about the cadence of what we do with Gravity. We have sort of regularly scheduled 
pitch meetings. In the world prior to Corona, those were in-person meetings, but certainly, you know, we, we will consider them being virtual for the, the nearest future, maybe even further beyond. But these pitch meetings are really meant to be twofold, right? One is uh, longer form, more personal, more high touch for the startups that are presenting. Uh, they're usually a longer form. You know, there are often angel networks and groups that will do sort of pitch nights where you get five minutes to try and describe everything that you do. And, you know, that 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 works in a lot of ways. Uh, but for our group, we, we like the idea of really spending time and, and at least digging in it at the high level and really that first that first consideration and first pass with our investing group. So you get a little bit longer form. The investors also get their opportunity to ask questions and really provide a different perspective than you might get coming from a room of sort of solely institutional investors. And again, that ties back to our working professional model, right? We've got people invested in the fund who run the gambit from you know medical backgrounds to manufacturing to logistics to tech to education there's a lot of diverse viewpoints in the room and you know quite often we get questions from people that wouldn't be surfaced in you know sort of the more traditional VC you know funnel model so the way I've I've tried to describe this to others is the management team and the and the people sort of responsible for the the blocking and tackling of the fund really handle the the logistics of investment right so we're out there on the front lines, uh, having initial discussions with startups, you know, making sure that we sign the paperwork and you know do our promotion, much like getting on great podcasts like yours, and having you know sort of this public face. But really, the the value of something like Gravity to excuse me, an investing member is the opportunity to be face to face with the entrepreneurs that you know they might ultimately be. Be investing in and have that connection. So, you know, there's sort of two sides to that coin. One side is for the startups that present to our group, you know, they get sort of more consideration and more direct connection. And then on the investor side, they get that same direct connection as well as, you know, potential for opportunity for continuing that relationship into the future, either personally, professionally. We've had opportunities of sort of synergy. I hate that term, but you know where we've got alignment between something one of our our members is doing and you know something one of our startups is doing and and some of that is part and parcel to what a VC fund should do in the sense of supporting their their startups but at the same time the again that connection between the individual the successful individual who's who's willing to put their capital on the table and the actual startup and what they're trying to do you know that can often get lost in in the sort of, again, more traditional VC model. To, to circle back, just to wrap my, my original statement, the investment decisions are made at two stages with our investing group. The first one is at the pitch night and then the decision to do due diligence. So everyone gets a vote. And if there, it's a majority vote, democratic voting process, if diligence is voted, so if there are enough you know, majority eyes and uh, over the over the nays, we will put together a small team. We will spend the next, say, six weeks or so doing diligence on the company. Can I ask a quick clarifying question? How many people are voting? Yeah. So to speak specifically to Fund4, we raised $750,000 at... 50k per unit. So basic math, those were 15 voting units. So Got it. there are, you know, 15 units, 15 votes that will be cast uh, as a part of this process. And and I might be casting one vote because I wrote a 50k check, and you might be casting two votes because you wrote a 100k check, right? Potentially, yeah. So you know, there are there are several sort of levers that we have to pull when it comes to how the fund itself can be can be structured. One is around the number of people, uh, one is around another is around the number of votes and then sort of the hybrid or, or co- combination of those is how many votes you can assign you can allow any individual or you know in, any entity to cast. Well, obviously if you if you overweight a single individual and their opinion and their number of votes then one you sort of break away from 
the member managed model and the idea of the group and the community of, in, of the, the members. Um, and two, you actually sort of start trending more towards more towards advisement or that, you know, that singular individual becoming sort of a manager in a sense, right? And that's not to say that we don't, you know, we don't want our members participating, but it's more to the fact that, you know, we've got this, this member managed model that allows us to operate in the way that we do. And if we were, if we were to allow someone to sort of offset or overweight uh, the other members in a way that was sort of inappropriate, uh, we, we might start trending down a path that we don't want to go. So, Yes, there are occasions where we have you know multiple votes associated with a, with an individual or an entity, um, but that's not really something that is too much of a concern for us. You know, we want we want to have as many uh, people involved as we can because ultimately the group's mind share, you know, that hive mind and you know the the total knowledge base of a bunch of successful individuals is really what makes gravity unique and different from you know, some of the other other investment funds out there. Got it. Uh, thanks. That's super helpful. Go ahead and keep going on the thread of you guys vote for diligence. Uh, majority carries. What happens next? Yeah. So we'll put together, if we vote for diligence and diligence is, is approved, then we will put together a small team. Uh, typically, it would be one manager and then one or two volunteer members who either you know have experience or knowledge in the space, or alternatively, just have a you know, strong interest in what the the company is doing. Uh, and then from there, they will they will really dig in with the with the entrepreneur, you know, or a couple of meetings, getting all the you know sort of access to the data rooms, getting all of the the boxes checked that would any typical fund would go through diligence with. They'll put together a report. That report is then shared with the broader member pool. Uh, hopefully, everyone does their homework prior to the next meeting. And then at the next meeting, before we see any new pitches, uh, we'll actually vote on investment based on the due diligence report, as well as the you know the terms of the investment themso- it, uh, themselves and the you know, convertible note versus safe and how much is being offered and what's being asked for. And I'm by no means asking for a complete list of every diligence item you might ever ask for. But if you could just rattle off rapid fire, what are some of the most common things? If, if I'm just asking this in case somebody's never been through diligence, what are some of the most common things you might be looking for in that process? Yeah, I, so we've got our, our due diligence sort of template, right? And it looks very similar to what you might expect from, from any uh, formal VC fund. So there's there's the financials, right? Where are you at currently? What is your plan and how do you expect to get there? Customer acquisition strategy, including marketing and sales, the team that's building the product or service, what are their backgrounds? You know, what experience do they have in doing this? You know, the the product or idea itself, competitive market space, and you know, all of these sort of big bucket categories. Those things are all there. But I, I would also say that. You know, the stage we invest in, which I, I should have said earlier, is really angel, pre-seed, and seed. Most of our decisions come down to the people involved, the idea, and then what amount of traction they have. Right? The uh, s- some of the some of the advice, and we'll get to I think this topic a little bit later. But often, you know, during the diligence process, we'll see people with five-year financial projections and. Honestly, at this stage, the, <laughs> most of that is just waving a magic wand or you know pulling numbers out of a hat. Because the idea that you're anyone is able to project five years into the future is, in some ways, it's a bit of a waste of time, right? Like I, I, I personally wouldn't put much stock in in any of the, any of those sort of projections. And I think you know if you look at how our diligence has gone. The decisions are made usually not based on that type of information, but instead, you know, who are we investing in, and you know, how how big is the idea, and and how quickly can they get can they get it into people's hands? You know, those are really the kind of fundamental decision making, uh, at least from my view. Awesome, thanks for that. Can you rattle off some of the companies that you invested in in Fund Four? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've got a pretty diverse portfolio, and I, I'm. I'm actually really proud of of the different types of companies that we invested in. Just to quickly run through the list. So Amplified Sciences is working on cancer screening technology. Great company out of of Lafayette. Uh, Digiop is a loss prevention service. 
um, that is moving to the cloud and, and helping their customers do the same. Open MarTech, led by one of uh, one of the local communities, uh, great entrepreneurs and, and Angel and, and their team, focusing on retail analytics. Perceivant is a higher education courseware company focusing on sort of underserved areas of higher education. Perfit is a retail software technology for helping bring that online shopping experience into the brick and mortar stores. Next is Safekeeping, a great company out of Zionsville focusing on long-term care visibility for patients, families, and friends. So knowing if, if grandma is doing well in the, the nursing home. Uh, Snapshift, uh, it's gotten a lot of press over the, the past sort of six to 12 months, doing a really good job in the gig worker space, providing on-demand staffing for food and beverage and, and uh, retail industries. Voxy is a really cool idea focusing around getting consumers in touch with the products that their favorite content creators are using. Um, so really interesting technology and idea behind that one. And then probably the, the most visible company that we've invested in uh, of the list is Woven. Woven recently raised a seed series investment led by our friends over at High Alpha. Really great team focusing on developer hiring and making sure there's an appropriate culture fit as well. So amongst that portfolio, you can kind of see we've got We've got some retail, we've got some marketing, uh, we've got some sort of gig worker economy, we've got medical, both in terms of actual, you know, sort of R&D, as well as software, and then even some education exposure there. So that I, I personally am really excited about our portfolio. We've got a lot of really great people, and a lot of really great ideas and, and you know, pretty broad cross section uh, across multiple industries. And I, I feel like I might miss a company here, but of all of those companies that you mentioned, I'm positive, Perceivant, Perfect, Safekeeping, and Woven have all been on this podcast. Uh, so you do a quick search for any of those company names plus startup competitors, you'll find that episode and uh, give that a listen. And I, I can't for the life of me remember if uh, Voxy came on and has done an episode or if we talked about it and I wasn't able to convert Nate to do it. So either way, you just uh, convinced me to, to go follow up on that and see if I can get him on if he's not been on yet. But that's awesome. That's a, that's a killer lineup. Yeah, we, we would love to see all of our, our, our portfolio podcasts. I, well, I don't, I don't have uh, connections into all of those companies. So maybe that would be a good uh, follow up for you and I coming out of this. Maybe you could make some introductions for me. That'd be killer. Happy to do it. So, Trey, do you guys have any swag for Gravity Ventures? Uh, we have business cards. That's about as far as we go right now. That That is not swag. Come on, man. you got to raise your game. Yes. If you're going to have swag for Gravity Ventures, what would it be? Um, I'd imagine that we need some T-shirts, some sort of awesome vests, right? Some sort of outerwear that we can rock over whatever it is that uh, you know we're wearing underneath to really show our pride. If you were going to send a Christmas gift to all of the founders of Fund4 that you guys invested in, what would you want to send them, branded, with Gravity Ventures? Oh, man. You put me on the spot here. I'm not sure it's I have okay. a It's okay. Um, it's a hard problem. Definitely not a fidget spinner. That, that's probably not going to be well, if you need help with that, figuring that out, or if you need any sort of uh, branded swag for your startup or your venture fund, you can go to Fuel Merchandise Group at fuelmerchandise.com and you can mention startup competitors and get 10% off your first order. Sounds awesome. I think I will need to do that because clearly I don't have a great answer for, for your question. They can help you out, man. It's all good. When you think about the kind of the the deal flow and funding strategy. Do you do you guys talk at all about diversity? Not not just in terms of industry and stuff like that, but do you look at like you know any many metrics around women led companies, minority led companies, anything like that? You know, it's it's a really relevant topic, especially right now. When we first started the fourth fund of gravity, I'll be honest, that was not in our purview. But as we progress through. The process and really learned how to do this because that, that's the other thing that I would also note is we, 
we don't pretend to have all the answers, right? We are all growing with this this organization and with our companies uh, together. So, but but certainly it is a it is a real consideration. I'm happy to to say that we have invested in you know some very strong women led companies, both in Snapshift and in Amplified Sciences. Both of those companies are. Um, have a, at least a female co-founder, if not a you know sort of sole female lead, but it, it's it's a very real consideration that that you know I think the companies that are going to be you know being built and seeking funding into the future are going to look at the lineups of both the previous investments that have been made by funds as well as the you know who's involved from a from an either a member or investor perspective and you know, that, that's that's something that's going to matter to people is the the amount of diversity uh, that's there so so certainly something that we are more and more conscious of every day um, and obviously happy that that we have the diversity that we have but always striving for more we're, we're never doing well enough in that arena and then what was the total timeline for fund for from the, you know, from you guys having the idea to, and maybe starting with, you know, you cash your first investor check to you've written the last check out of the fund and you're now kind of done and can close the books on that one. Yeah. As I mentioned in the, the lead up a little bit, we formally closed the fund in April. So we started fundraising, I would say, in October-ish of and that's 2018 April 20. and closed the fund in 2019. So we started fundraising in October 2018, closed the fund in April, formally in April 2019. We actually made our first investment prior to closing. We did a rolling close um, through, the, through the month of April. So... You know that was a little bit sort of awkward, um, but we had a great opportunity to invest, and so we we want to make sure that we jumped on that. You did ask a question earlier that I wanted to address. We we do do our capital call all up front, so we we ask our investors to write their checks up front. It that is beneficial for a couple of reasons. One is that we're able to move quickly, and we have capital in the bank. Uh, two is that we don't have to sort of ask investors down the line to come back and you know provide us a five thousand dollar check right that that can be a little bit of a hassle for people and to be totally transparent it it, it helps reaffirm the sort of democratic voting process and the majority wins so that you know if if we vote as a group to invest and there's you know, a couple of people that decided they didn't really like that idea and they're not going to really contribute their checks. I mean, not to say that we would have that problem, but it sort of avoids that problem altogether because the the money's in the bank and, you know, we're ready to roll. So just wanted to be clear about that point um, because it's important. I absolutely love it. Thank you. And a, a, just a follow-up question to that, which might be a little too insider baseball, but I'm I'm really curious how do you handle all of the management fees for the fund? So legal accounting, processing K-1s each year. Is that part of that original funds raised or do members get follow-up kind of invoices in future years for that kind of stuff? We do a little bit of hold back effectively. So you know, the fund structure is pretty standard for what you would see from other VC funds out there. Again, no, no, nobody in the management team is, is going to retire or, or really do this even full time, right? This is this is something we're doing because we want to support the community and because we are invested in these ideas more than just the dollars. Um, but that being said, you know there is a small fee associated with it. But really, the management team doesn't get paid unless the underlying companies do well, and and that's very much by intent. Um, in terms of the the hold back, the legal fees, marketing fees, things like that are all coming out of either. Uh, it, it depends on what the what the expense is. If it's a legal fee, it comes out of the fund, and if it's a sort of event type fee, we we might cover that out of the the management fee. So it it really just depends. But again, we're not talking huge amounts of dollars here, right? I think out of so out of fund four, we held back five percent ish for legal fees ongoing, and that's another thing to note about the funds. If you if you look at the previous funds. The horizon for the the sort of closure of the fund broadly uh, is really eight to ten years, and that's obviously an estimate. And we don't know what's going to happen with Fund Four, but 
you know, these are these are longer term relationships that don't have a, a, a sort of specified event horizon, right? There are some companies are going to exit sooner or potentially shut down. Um, and others are going to be around hopefully much longer, right? But the the fund itself it continues to exist as this perpetual entity. So we we take a little chunk of that, hold it back uh, for you know, those ongoing legal, you know, expected legal expenses. And all right. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about plans for fund five. What's next? Yeah. So we had a ton of fun with fund four and and invested in some really great companies. I have to be really careful about how I, I talk about this. I would say that we've had some good interest from both current investors as well as uh, some potentially new investors in running another fund. Um, and it's some, certainly something that we're considering, but we haven't started a formal fundraise. Obviously, the economic climate right now is a, a little bit challenging um, and no one really knows what's going to happen. So at this point, I would say that you know the future is bright and there's a lot of opportunity out in the market. I think there are even more companies now than there were when we started a year ago. You see some really great activities from some of the other groups to help support that that sort of company kickoff process and really getting ideas off the ground into you know formal entities and and helping entrepreneurs grow both their you know their idea from the little seedling that they have in their brain up into something that actually has some substance around it and and so those activities in those groups you know elevate G beta uh, even developer town you guys have some great platforms to help get companies to the point at which a, a group like gravity would be able to invest and so you know even from where we started you know now 18 months ago started fundraising there are more companies than i think ever before at least in our indiana and midwest market to consider and invest in so you know opportunity is there we're just waiting for the right confluence of of events to to set the stage for whatever it is that we decide to do next right on so let's switch gears, switch to some fun topics. Hit me with like your most awkward moment in a pitch. Ooh, most awkward moment in a pitch. So at the point at which someone comes to talk to us, you know, they're usually, they have probably 60% of what I would call the, you know, the the standard pitch ready. Obviously, we want to get them to to 100% before they come to the group but for for the pre-screening that the management team does you know there's usually there's usually usually some missing pieces and i think one of the most glaring missing pieces that often that often shows up is the lack of competitive awareness and i i personally i've i've seen both sides of the argument right where you say what well, does it matter if you have competitors if you just execute really well and that that is true but the flip side of that is if you don't know where your competitors are playing, especially in a space that's extremely established, then how are you going to position your solution or the thing that you're building against what's already going on in the market? So I think some of the most awkward conversations are, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a pitch and I'm, I'm really interested in the idea and I'm, I'm listening and I'm, I'm half Googling on the side and, you know, seeing, seeing the, the types of things that are already maybe in the space or tangential to the space that the entrepreneur wants to operate in. And, you know, you, you bring up, Oh, so what about, you know, X, Y, Z, they look like they do this. And then, you know, hearing a, Oh, I haven't heard of those guys. It's like, well, I, I spent 10 seconds Googling while you were talking to me and they popped up. Right. So I think, I, I think that's, that's probably the most difficult to sort of operate around is the, lack of market awareness sometimes that that comes at these earliest stage ideas you know the irony of that is that is exactly the reason why we started startup competitors which is why we have the startup competitors podcast right like we it's that exact same thing where somebody would come into pitch 10 seconds of googling we'd find a competitor who's raised 20 million dollars to solve the problem that they're trying to solve and it literally they had no awareness and we're like no we j we literally took your product idea typed it into google and found three companies that that are doing what you want to do <laughs> how do you not know this it's insane yeah that's so that's so crazy and honestly like in in that situation 
that's that's validation, right? Like you, you should be if if your idea is so great that another company is out there and has raised money to do it, you should be leaning on that as a reason that there is there is demand for the thing that you're building and then why you want to do it better, right? Or how you do it better differently. But that that should be a point of of benefit, of value to your pitch. And when I yeah, when you when you hear an entrepreneur pitch and they don't they don't seem to know who else is operating in the space, regardless of how good the idea is, you have to sort of take a step back and say, okay, you know, you've got a little more work to do here, right? And that that's okay. That's okay. Any unique or kind of like unique in a positive way, like unique uh, or like really insightful moments in a pitch where a founder has done something that is like not part of the standard, you know, five slide deck uh, where they, they took a tangent that on the other side of that, you're like, wow, like I wish all founders could do that. Or, you know, like where they just really stood out as above and beyond because of a specific uh, approach that they took in the conversation or the pitch. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pick on, I say pick on, I'm going to, I'm going to hold up one of the, one of the companies that we invested in. So, so Wes Winham with Woven, they were actually, they pitched to our group as a, a stand-in. Uh, we had, we had a, a company back out for me being able to pitch to us. So I'll, I'll first say that you know, running these pitch meetings as the one of the organizers, right? You've got you've got a lot of people to coordinate. So you've got the the members, and they need to be present, right? Because we 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 want their vote, we want their pay, we want their you know their input, and and they're a value to our process. So our investing members need to be there, and then you got to coordinate that with the the companies coming to present, right? So there are, there are inevitably going to be conflicts and. You know, wires crossed and so things will happen. So we had a we had a group drop out. You know, we had been considering woven for for quite some time. So and and Wes was available. You know, I've known Wes for quite a while. Uh, I, I have known him since way before they ever started woven and saw him trying to to fix the problems that they're solving now. So one of the things though that's super impressive to your point or to your question about something that was unique and different is the level of data and metric quantification for what they were doing. So it's one thing to have an answer for every question that you're asked, but it's another thing to be able to say, here's my answer, here's how I'm tracking it, and here is the target or goal for that particular thing that you're being asked about. That That's something that was extremely impressive, but also you know, very indicative of, I think, the way the way Wes operates that business, um, and if every if every entrepreneur had at least a quantifiable idea for how to how to target a goal around the types of things that that investors typically ask, we would probably accelerate both diligence and then decision making by you know three to four x across the board, right? So ultimately, I think it results in the ease of which an entrepreneur puts forward their their idea to their investing group and the amount of thought and ultimately sort of organization around the ideas that you know again the the diligence process is pretty standardized at this point it's been around a really long time we're not doing anything unique in our diligence but you have to still check those boxes and the way that you go about doing that is j- even the answers themselves are one thing but the thought process and the sort of logic chain that you use to get to the answer is equally as important and sometimes even more important because, yeah, as you know, Mike, at this stage, the, the companies and the ideas, they change over time. They pivot, right? And the idea that you're giving money to someone rather than something, that, that's part and parcel to angel investing. So the, the logic chain behind how to invest or excuse me, how to make decisions uh, within a business is ultimately even more important than the idea that the company is on right now. So we're obviously big believers in Woven and Wes and the whole team. Um, but I think that's something that stood out in a way that maybe other other groups did not. Yeah. And I, I would echo that. If, if you want to experience just a, a small, tiny bit of that with Wes, episode 50 of this podcast, I think it was like, November ish of 2018 when when I chatted with him 
you know, the, the podcast opens with me asking Wes a simple question like, tell me about technical recruiting or recruiting technical talent. And he like breaks down this beautiful like three to five part dissertation about the recruiting process, how it's broken, how they've quantified it. Like, like It's just amazing. And he's doing this all off the top of his head, right? Like there's no notes. There's no, you know, he's just sitting there talking to me, having a conversation and it just such complete and total ownership of the problem, the space and the solution that, you know, he can break it down in such a beautifully articulate way. And I, I think part of that is just a gift of the way that Wes thinks. And, but, but I also think, uh, you know, the other, you know, the, the second half of that is the work that that team has put into that space and, and they just how deeply they understand it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a hundred percent right. And the idea that if someone is going to, is going to start asking you questions about why you're doing what you're doing. If you can't back that up with, yes, qualitative assessment, right? Like, oh, I know someone who has this pain, yada, yada. That That's very important. But then the tying that to quantitative metrics that make the, that, that paint the rest of the picture and ultimately end up being the types of things that you're going to both commit to providing back to your investing group, but also help people understand, help people who don't have the, qualitative problem, right? I've never known anybody who had that problem. I don't personally, I'm not going to be the buyer of your thing, but I know, I know numbers, right? I know how to look at numbers and I, I understand not me, you know, your investing group can understand how you want your business to progress based on quantitative metrics is that, that is, that's going to be part and parcel to, to your idea, regardless of what industry or space you play in. And I think that's a really important. Awesome. All right. This might be a good place to wrap things up. If folks want to get a hold of you or Gravity Ventures, want to learn more about Gravity Ventures, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So uh, we've got our website, www.gravityventures.com. We've got info at Gravity Ventures. You're also welcome to reach out directly to me, trey.buck at gravityventures.com. We are on LinkedIn. We are not particularly active on social media, but certainly have have those avenues and channels. So uh, please feel free to reach out. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.